Welcome back to In Light of the Gospel, episode 13. For those of you that don't know Greg Clausen, I think you'll be really blessed to hear this story. He's a friend of mine that I met many years ago when I was working at North Star. He was single at the time. Now he's married to Bethany, and they have six beautiful young girls and no sons. He uh, spent three years in the Canadian military and now has totally transformed his view on life and is taking a path towards being a missionary. He's studying and training with Ethnos 360, which was formerly New Tribes Missions. He spent a year in Wisconsin learning the Bible, learning how to, to study and understand the scriptures, and now is spending two years in Durham, Ontario, learning how to be a missionary, learning the practicalities of how to reach cross-culturally. And uh, they don't know for sure where their mission base will be. They're looking maybe South America, maybe Mexico, maybe even way northern Canada among the Inuits. They're not quite sure at this point yet. But I think you'll be really blessed to hear this story. He, uh, he has a very ambitious take on life, and I really appreciate him. He's a steady influence on my life, and I appreciate him very much. So God bless you. Thank you for following along. I do appreciate anyone who subscribes to the channel or likes the videos, and I appreciate anyone who's just paying any attention to what I have to say. So thanks a lot, and uh, God bless you. You were born and raised in Canada, right? Yes, sir. St. Thomas area? Yeah. Because that's where, when I first met you, obviously we were both working at North Star. I remember a couple times even you and I would hop in the vehicle and we'd go grab something, bite to eat, and we stopped at your house the one day. But you were just this young guy. What would you have been back then, 18, 19 years old? Yeah, yeah. Was when I was working at North Star the first time, I was probably 18 or 19. Okay. How many siblings do you have? Just one sister. Okay, that's what I was thinking. And uh, your parents were not anything like my parents. They were an old colony, no hardcore Mennoniteism in your past, right? No, my, my parents were both born in Mexico. Um, my dad got saved in California when he was 18. He's in his early 70s now, so that was a long time ago. And uh, my mom got saved when she was a teenager as well, sort of out of the old colony background. So In Mexico? She got saved in Mexico, but she, she still lived with her family. And uh, it wasn't until she got married. She, she married my dad when she was 20. Mm -hmm. He was 28. And then that was sort of a impetus to sort of step out of the, some of the traditions, I, I guess, a little bit. That yeah. she, she already wasn't really adhering to, personally. So they got married in Canada then? or Yeah, they were married in Canada. They, oh, I see. Yeah. That's a different uh, story than most of the people that I've talked to so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it's how that reflected on me. I was raised very much just a traditional Canadian I had a very normal Canadian upbringing. No low German. No, we didn't. My parents spoke German, but it was kind of just like a language that we didn't understand. They didn't teach us German. Um, yeah. So As far as church goes, you were usually like EMC type of Mennonite church? Yeah, my dad w would have just been cons conservative evangelical, like whatever would have uh, lined up with his doctrine. He wouldn't have claimed to be a Mennonite? No. No. Like he's, I mean, not that he was had anything against Mennonite right. people. It was just the religion-wise, he, he yeah. was would have just been born again, conservative, evangelical. It wasn't really a denomination thing for him. It was yeah. just whoever was... Uh, if they're preaching the gospel, exactly. teaching the Bible. Yeah. I know yeah, he's, he's come to visit our congregation a few times, and he just loves anytime he hears the Bible being taught. Right? Yeah. yeah. But when I met you guys, you guys were, te you were attending the St. Thomas GFC, which I guess wasn't Mennonite, really. No, I, well, it was affiliated with the EMMC in right. Elmer for a while, right. but then they, they sort of broke affiliation after a while and okay. became sort of independent. But yeah, they had a lot of people that were from a similar background, people that were from a background who got saved. and, and uh, Yeah, well, I knew Jake Clausen fairly well, right? That's how yeah. I was associated with that group. So what, what was your childhood like? like What's kinda, something that stands out? Well... I mean, one of the things that, I, looking back, that I see now, I almost see in my parents a bit of a rebellion against some of their cultural heritage. Okay. So, I mean, they they went almost a little bit extreme the opposite way. They gave us a lot of liberty, a lot of rope to hang ourselves, I guess you could say, compared to the, your traditional Mennonite upbringing. So, so we, they weren't strict. No, they weren't very strict at all. I mean, I would have thought they were, but that was just my ignorance, <laughs> I guess. No, they were very easygoing. Um 
Yeah. It, so you got to go where you wanted to go. If your friends wanted you to have you over, you were good yeah, to go. We had did, did they? You had plenty of money. You were able to get the kinds of shoes you wanted and clothes you liked. And... Oh, I mean that. I just never really cared about those things. So oh, okay. I was perfectly happy to wear whatever was provided for me. Okay. Kind of a thing. But yeah, I mean, we didn't. We weren't obligated to do a lot. I guess like we didn't have lots of chores. My sister and I. My mom was kind of content to do all those things herself. Yeah. So, yeah, we got to be a little bit lazy, I guess, growing up, which mm -hmm. we're, we're sort of rebelling the other way again and trying to break some Bring of those bad kids habits. back to yeah. tradition and, yeah. and work ethic and all that. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you, so you only had the one sibling and you're the younger one, right? Yes. And so what, like, what was uh, church and things like that like for you guys? Is that kind of where you got in obviously introduced to God, but your parents must have talked about the scriptures a fair bit too. Yeah. Um, so you specifically about my sister and yeah. I and how our, our time growing up? Well, uh, well, we didn't really get along, but I guess that would be pretty typical of siblings. Oh, really? But we, we weren't very close. We're much closer now. But we just had different interests, and she was, she's a very... I was more of a passive personality, and she was very much a type A personality, I guess, and she was wanted to take the lead and just do her own thing and mm -hmm. chart Plus, her own she's trail. the older sibling... Yeah. So we really didn't spend a lot of time together, but uh, sort of the second part of that question, I guess, is how that reflected in our church life and things like that. We kind of went our own way. Um, she entered a sort of a rebellious stage like a lot of people do in her teenage years. And was okay. Doing, I guess that's kind of where I was thinking yeah. where did things go. Yeah. So I guess we both did in our own way, but um, she got married very young. She had just turned 17 and she was married to an American soldier which wasn't, my parents consented to that. They had to agree to that, but what, it was. What do they do? Right? Yeah, exactly. 17 years old and she married an American soldier where he just kind of came along and swept her off her feet? Yeah, she was She was kind of traveling in those circles. She was in the Canadian reserves. Oh, I and see. Which was another thing that sort of stemmed from some of that rebellion, I guess. And, and uh, so she met him and married him when she was... And he ended, up, he ended up being a pretty good guy now, eh? He's an amazing guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? Eh? You can plan and plan and plan and hope that your kids find the perfect good man that's going to come and take care of your daughter. Yeah. Like now, we have, you have plenty of daughters, mm -hmm. you know, and I have several, and mm -hmm. I often think about this, but you might find a guy who's dressed just right and looks the part and plays the part and has stayed out of trouble, and then he gets married and he's a loser. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? Yeah. And then some guy comes along and snatches your daughter at 17 and he ends up taking really good care of her. And yeah. Like you can't plan for that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so for for her, it had a happy ending, I guess, for me as well. But so. then at 17, she was out of the house, and you were several years younger? Yeah, a year and a half. We're fairly oh, okay. close. But, um, yeah, we're, we're quite close. Yeah, so for me, church was, I, I was always very much outward. I was good at outward conformity. So people wouldn't have really seen my internal struggles or the things that were going on in my heart. And I always would have outwardly defended like a Christian position pretty vehemently. So at school or with friends or things like that, people would have always considered me the Christian person. Mm -hmm. But then I had a lot of internal struggles. Like I was addicted to pornography for the, the basically from probably age 12 on wow. until we were married. And again, this was kind of my parents giving us a lot of liberty, rope to hang ourselves. Is They just were very naive, I guess, what people were like. They didn't well, the really, internet was a new thing. Yeah. And they didn't know what was going on in schools. Like they, they just, they took a lot of things for granted, I guess. Hmm. And that just reflected on the way that I grew up. So yeah. spent a lot of time just doing the things that I wanted to do. And again, like outwardly, I was would have looked very good, but on the inside, I had a lot of turmoil. And yeah, and religion struggling. tends to do that, right? Where yeah. you uh, you cover it up enough to where you appear whitewashed. Yeah. Whitewash too. Jesus uses that terminology, right? So you're you're addicted from like twelve on, and then do you do you make a profession of faith at youth or something like that, or where does Christ come into the picture? Goodness, this is a hard part of the testimony because I actually don't have a good answer for that. Okay. And you know when I think about my testimony, I want it to be the testimony of Jesus Christ, and I'm super glad that Christ saved me, but I have no idea when when he did you it. came to that. Faith. Yeah. So I mean, I would have made. A, a confession, I guess you can say, at age four with my parents. And I, I honestly don't know if that's legitimate because, like, in my own life, I wouldn't say that for other people, but I can look over my life and 
I think I can see God working even from then on, you know, through my whole life that he's been guiding and directing me. But I mean, there's large portions of my life where... You basically it, ignored God. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it, it wouldn't have been... I had a guy evidence. here a few weeks ago and I talked to him and he says the same thing. He went to a, a meeting. He was an old colony, never had been exposed to the gospel or anything like mm-hmm. that. He went to these special meetings and they, he heard the gospel. He understood that Jesus had died for him. He was very young, maybe six or eight or something mm-hmm. like that. And uh, then he spent his teenage years rebelling. But it, it was almost as if he wasn't able to comfortably rebel. God was always after him. Mm -hmm. So he does feel like maybe he did actually get saved and God wasn't letting him get off the hook, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But then he struggled through his teen years and his 20s, always resisting the promptings of the Spirit Mm -hmm. and got into alcoholism and all kinds of stuff. So I'm not going to be the judge, but I, for myself too, I think I want the gospel to be so prevalent in our household that my kids might not know the exact moment, but that they would just obviously think, well, of course, Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, exactly. I want them to know that from young on. Was was the cross emphasized? I know your dad understood the gospel. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think that maybe was part of his lack of understanding on how to communicate that. Because I don't know if I, I would have understood the basic uh, tenets of the gospel, I guess, that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died for me and and that I needed to trust him. And that's where I, how I would be saved. But I guess I just didn't know how to apply that in any any situation mm. beyond that, and and I I just can't remember well enough to know how that actually affected my life. Well, I can see the fruit of, of and there wasn't a lot of fruit, but I mean I I knew it. So thinking back, it's like kind of hard for me to share that part of my testimony because I just don't know. There doesn't seem to be a clear conversion no. at one point. The way that you were describing that guy's situation would very much apply to me. Like I never had peace doing those things, so I can look back and say that, yeah, maybe that was God working on me and convicting me and just drawing me mm-hmm. and conforming me into his image very slowly and mm-hmm. basically dragging me along, kicking and screaming. But I don't know. Yeah. Because so. for me, I was, I was a good Mennonite boy, and I felt bad doing bad things. So I, I just stayed away from parties. I stayed away from drugs, stayed away from alcohol, never got, you know, never had premarital sex, all that stuff. I was, I was good. Mm-hmm. And I would have felt horrible had I gone contrary to what I believed. Mm-hmm. But I was in no way anywhere close to saved. I didn't understand the gospel one little bit. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I was 21 years old that the gospel was delivered to me in such a way where finally it was like, well, this isn't about going to church. This mm-hmm. isn't about reading a Bible. This is something that he did for me. Mm-hmm. You know, like in Galatians, it talks about uh, before whose eyes Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. He wasn't crucified in Galatia. Mm-hmm. But the Galatians saw him in their mind's eye, crucified among them, right? Where when the gospel was finally delivered to me in such a way where the preacher said, I picture Jesus being beaten to the point where he looked more like hamburger meat by the time he was done. The Bible says, I may tell all my bones, he was referring to looking to Jesus looking down on his body. And it was, it was like I could see Jesus being crucified for the first time. And it was clear. It was not just generic thing that he did to save the world. He did it because of my sin. It should have been me that was there on the cross, right? So that, that's when all of a sudden, like, it was just like night and day. I, I was converted at one point, right? Like I knew for sure now that this is the cross and the death of Jesus is the only thing. Mm-hmm. So for you, it kind of slowly kind of pieced together. You knew these things and were taught them, but it didn't become paramount or super relevant to you. Yeah. Yeah, that would be an accurate way to describe it. Did you, was there, how about, like, sometimes when people are saved, they fall in and out of seriousness with God, right? Mm -hmm. And and that was, I mean, part of my testimony, like, I think it would be a lot of people who were in a similar situation is very often it was, uh, it ended up being works. So, you know, I would bounce between uh, works and sin, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I could spend some time being very righteous and then I would fall back into sin and, you know, find the just travel on those patterns, those hills and valleys, and never just uh, wasn't actually able to rest in Christ. So you mentioned something there, and when you said your dad probably didn't know how to articulate these things properly, what like, what do you think would be the major problem? Because I hear this kind of stuff from Mennonite churches or um, Christian conservative churches all the time. Mm-hmm. Young people spend their whole life in that environment, and yet they don't know for sure if they're saved. They mm-hmm. think they are because they made some confession. And they try to do what's right, but they have no joy doing it. There's not this real automatic conversion. Do you, do you have anything to chalk that up to? I mean, I just think that's uh, generally the way that human beings human beings operate, just the way that people think, is we have a tendency 
we have a tendency towards the flesh. We have a tendency towards the flesh, and it ends up in two extremes. So either it ends up in sin or it ends up in legalism. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to navigate that and, and just focus on the gospel. So, I mean, his his deficiencies as a father, like, I mean, I think he really did the best he could with the information he had. But um, just the ability, I guess, to communicate that it, everything depended on the finished work of Christ, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it wasn't even that he... He was explaining things differently. It was maybe just that that wasn't the focus in some of the situations. So, I mean, he didn't know about my sin, so he didn't really yeah. have an, uh, an opportunity to, to address that. And in my legalism, I mean, I looked really nice on the outside. So I guess in that sense, maybe with my parents, the, the issue at all wasn't with their teaching. It was just that they didn't understand me or had, you know, didn't, yeah. maybe didn't understand I guess the depths I, of depravity I, that I, their kids were capable of, you know? Right. So, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to necessarily even pick on you, Mr. Clausen, if you end up watching this. I mean, even just the church itself. Is there mm -hmm. some reason why the tendency is towards that, where the gospel isn't, 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 is it maybe not emphasized properly or enough? Or how come a Christian, quote unquote, whether they're real Christians or not, would, would bounce back and forth between living in sin and living in legalism when they should be living in grace and in the favor of God, mm -hmm. like where where is the lack here? And that's why I don't know if I was saved or not, because I think if I if I really understood the gospel and, and how to apply it in all of these circumstances, I wouldn't have lived that way. Yeah. But I mean, I, I, I understood that Jesus died for me and that He did these things for me. Like I understood, like First Corinthians chapter fifteen, the gospel. You know, like this is what you need to believe. But I didn't know how to to apply those things to my life, how when I was struggling in sin, how that was the victory over sin, that Christ had already taken care of it. So, I mean, I would, I would totally be willing to acknowledge that it's possible I wasn't saved. I honestly don't yeah. know. But I mean, at some point along the way, I'm super thankful that Christ was gracious yeah, enough to reveal it's these things It's become very to clear to me uh, through your testimony now, mm -hmm. too, from knowing you for the last several years, that you seem very clear on the gospel and it's mm -hmm. become a very big part of your life, right? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, when we, you and I met, I, I was saved, but I was also in a track of probably somewhat toying with legalism at the time where mm -hmm. I knew Jesus had finally taken my sins. Mm -hmm. But now I was also at a very, very conservative, very plain Mennonite type of church. And so I was very, very serious about serving God, right? And yeah. I think you and I had some good interactions at work there. And at that time, it seemed like you were kind of just a, almost like transitioning from being somewhat of a carefree, frivolous teenager to now deciding, what do I want to do with my life? Where do I go from here? Is there anything that stands out from you that, at that time? Well, I mean, as far as our interactions, I definitely remember you. Yeah? You seemed very righteous to me then. <laughs> Over-righteous? <laughs> no, in a good way. In a good way. Okay. I, I sort of aspired to that righteousness, but I guess I always thought that, that that would sort of come with maturity, that, you know, at a certain point, I just realized, like, there was something that would change in me, and all of a sudden, I could would be able to overcome sin. Because I've always sort of looked at you in a way, I, I kind of looked at you as like the perfect man. Oh, boy. A man without sin. Wow. I, I've known Dan for a long time, just for the audience. So, But I guess maybe I idolized you a little bit spiritually because you seemed so righteous to me and because knowing my background, I wasn't righteous. Like I knew myself and I knew my own sin. So I guess I sort of wanted to aspire to be more like you in a wow. certain way. Well, I mean, things happened so starkly to me that I became extremely passionate, right? Like, I mean, at North Star there, I would rebuke the guys for looking at pornography. But I had struggled with that severely myself. Like, it's not like I was somehow free of any kind of sin in my past. But when I was set free through the gospel, I became very passionate about those kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'd, I'd walk into a, a variety store or something like that. I remember once at the, not the Flying J truck stop, the other one, the Fifth Wheel truck stop maybe. And I walked in with my daughters, I think it was, and they had these, you know, half pornography magazines mm -hmm. in the front row, right at the kids level. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I rebuked them and I asked to speak to their manager and I'm like, you got to change this. This cannot be, you know, mm -hmm. so I was very passionate about these kinds of things. So I would have appeared to be maybe overrighteous. I mean, you, you didn't know me well enough if you thought I was without sin, that's for sure. <laughs> But I, it seemed like there was a point there where you got really serious about serving God and mm -hmm. serious about your Christian walk. And it seemed like, to me, from my perspective, it seemed like it happened over one weekend all of a sudden. And I don't know if that was when you just got serious or when if you understood something more deeply or not, but maybe I'm off. I'm not sure. I'm, you're talking about when we were working at North Star? Yeah. <clears throat> 
Yeah, I, I, I don't really remember specifically, but there was a time there, around that point in my life, like I would have been roughly 18, where I did get serious, <clears throat> like much more serious about my faith. And that's when I hadn't been baptized yet, so that's when I, I wanted to get baptized. Okay. But then again, that was, there was a, definitely a lot of immaturity there too. It was kind of in myself. It was something that I could do outwardly, that it was like a transition point in my life. I, I kind of decided if I could be baptized, and I, that that would be like the moment where I would be more able to leave some of my fleshly things behind. Okay. And then from this moment on, I could be more serious. So, I, and that's because outwardly, I always did want to be serious, but I battled with my flesh. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even when I was a teenager, during a lot of my struggles, like I could be super serious about my faith, depending on who I was with. But then in private, it would be different. And probably not even so much that you were being a hypocrite, but you do feel serious about your faith. And then you, when you're tempted, you also go with with your flesh right yeah i just didn't yeah. have the Spirit the well, understanding to be able to overcome yeah so the weekend that i'm remembering is you you had your eye on a certain young lady mm. and uh, i asked you what you liked about her and you said something along the lines of like i uh, uh, um, i don't know she's pretty she's fun i'm like okay well what what are you looking for in a woman and then, I, and then you kind of turned it around on me and said, okay, well, Dan, what were you looking for in a woman? If you were looking for a woman, I said, well, I would, I would want her to be someone who smiles a lot and who laughs, someone who treats her dad with respect, someone who doesn't get angry when she loses a game, someone who's good with kids, someone who likes, loves Jesus. You know, I, I gave you a, a, kind of a generic list of things that I would look for. Mm -hmm. And that weekend, you came back the next week and you said, you know that girl I was really interested? I'm not interested in her anymore. I said, I saw that she flirts with every guy out there. She's always putting her hands on people. I forget what you all said, but you had seen some things about her after that weekend where you're like, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't too much longer after that where you met Bethany, and she was like the exact opposite, never flirtatious, very mm -hmm. sweet and kind, and all the things that you were hoping to look for. Right? So I don't know if you remember that, but it stood Actually, out to me. I don't recall at all. Okay. So well, that was in my here. mind. But yeah, that was, it was very clear. And then we also had little arguments or debates over movies that we watched or video mm -hmm. games that we played. And yeah. I kind of criticized your, your habits a little bit there. Oh, I still remember your exposition of Romans chapter one. Oh yeah? Not only those who do these things, but those who Those that little. take pleasure in them. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So go on from there. I mean, I know you, uh, after you got married, or maybe you want to talk more about that, meeting Bethany and getting married, but I know after you got married, you went out and became a soldier yourself. Yeah, so, well, I can very briefly sort of talk about after my baptism. So I was baptized but when I was 18, but it didn't, it didn't make a huge spiritual... It didn't change it didn't spiritually? Change me like what? It, yeah. This, I thought the shocker, water right? would finally do it. Yeah, it's, surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was still just a man. But um, I guess in a, in a sense, it, it was a process of maturing me. Like God definitely used that to mature me because he made me realize that there was very little power in baptism in yeah. and of itself. Apart from the cross, it means nothing. So, but I had to learn that through struggles and in continuing in sin. And uh, I shouldn't say that I had to. I, I should say that I did yeah. learn that that way. But it is, it's almost like God's grace to you to say, look, this isn't going to work either. You can try yeah. any number of things. Yeah. And uh, just, I guess, slowly just drawing me to the cross and just the cross and nothing else. And uh, so during that process, it was a, a couple of years where I was growing. And, and at that stage in my life, I think I, I was saved. Like I, at that point, I'm pretty confident that I, under, that I understood the gospel and was trusting only in Christ right. after my baptism and some years after that. And uh, yeah, then met Bethany. So that's my wife. We have six children together now, but... Six girls. Six girls. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was super blessed to be able to marry her. That was one of my aspirations and life goals, was to marry somebody who was like my mom. But I just, I always respected, super deeply, I respected my mom. Oh, that's awesome. I yeah. didn't know that. Just somebody who was quiet and patient, and kind of like you said, the things that I was... Uh, that I had been looking at, I guess, at one point and, and considering mm -hmm. and I realized that they didn't have any real value. And I uh, looked at Bethany and saw the things that did have value. So yeah. a quiet spirit and gentle. Well, we, I mean, we've, we've observed her from the time before you guys were married. We didn't know her very well, obviously, but we watched the way she operated and interacted with you. And then now since you've been married and we've seen the, sometimes the crazy decisions that you make, 
and how sweetly she <laughs> follows along and, and doesn't mm -hmm. get overwhelmed too much. I mean, she, mm -hmm. you can tell sometimes it's hard for her to swallow, mm -hmm. but she's like, this is the man that I've been given and I'm going to serve him and honor him. And it's, she seems to be doing a great job from outward appearances, right? So. She's a gem. <laughs> yeah, she's one of a kind. And she is. Yeah, I guess that's, that's true. She definitely follows me all sorts of crazy places. Yeah. So I'm very grateful for that. Shortly after you got married, you were thinking pretty seriously about becoming a police officer. Yeah. And is that what led you into the army? Yeah, so... Military, army, am I saying it right? Yeah, the, the military. I was in the army, I was infantry. So I, I guess I had sort of that I, idea and desire. Like I, I have a, an adventure-seeking personality, so I, I like the idea of adventure and I like doing things that are um, robust and bold and courageous and... You know, I just, mm -hmm. I'm drawn to that kind of thing. I'm drawn to conflict in certain ways. And so policing seemed like sort of a natural choice. So I did a lot of the prerequisites and had a lot of my ducks in a row to, to do that and was kind of ready to apply to some policing jobs. Uh, it's, I don't know if people are aware, but it's pretty competitive to get into policing. Like you have to do quite a bit of things to really be uh, a plausible candidate, I guess you'd yep. say, like a realistic, have an, an opportunity, like a realistic chance to, to get into it. So I was at a stage, I guess, where I felt like I'd probably be somewhat competitive in that market. And I just kept getting promotions at the job that I was working at. So we, I stayed there and was working just in a factory. I was supervising in a factory for a couple of years. And it kind of got to a point where I, I, I wanted to change. And I, so I did, I did apply to a couple of policing jobs, but it's like a very long process to do policing. And a lot of times I'm a little bit impatient and that's probably a fault of mine. But it would have been, it was a much shorter process to get into the military. And the, the adventure of the military, I guess, seemed like greater. Did you see it as a moment. stepping stone to something else or just you wanted the adventure? Yeah, I mean, it was, there was definitely that as well. I mean, the, in my mind, the possibility of getting into policing after the military is your prospects are better. Yeah. So I thought it, it wouldn't really hurt professionally me long term. Like my, my professional pro prospects wouldn't be diminished by going to the military. And you had a brother-in-law who's in the U.S. military. Your sister herself had been part of uh, military training. Mm -hmm. And so this just seemed like an, a natural option? or Yeah, and I, the way I sort of describe it to people is I never really considered it an option before this moment. And at that point, I was about 25 years old. And uh, I had just never considered the military seriously as an option. I, It just seemed like something that people don't do like it just doesn't seem like something that you would just uproot your family and yeah. go and do it I, I didn't know anybody else yeah and then i guess as soon as it became an option it became something that i wanted to do yeah so and then i had the, the allure of it yeah. the excitement around it yeah. and once i set my mind to a thing then yeah it becomes difficult <laughs> well we know to, that that kind of yeah. becomes a theme in your testimony once you set your mind to a thing yeah so that's what we did and it, bethany as you said, she very graciously agreed to... Because that wasn't easy for her, right? To no. see you, you had to leave for a number of weeks at a time. Yeah, I was gone for basically six months for training, and I got to see her sporadically through that, very sporadically, especially for the first three months. Didn't and you had Lucy already? We had three. Three yeah, already, we had that's our right. three daughters. We didn't spend a lot of time with you during that no, stage, didn't. so I didn't know... Yeah, so that was definitely a very challenging period of our life, but I guess the way that we considered it, excuse me, it was going to be three years of, it was a three-year contract. So with the, uh, with the infantry, I signed up for the infantry. So we agreed to, I guess, three years of trial and maybe a little bit of adventure along the way. And she was willing to do that. And then after that three years, then we would sort of see what came after that. Okay. So she was willing to, to do that with me, to go for three years and be willing to do with a little bit less. But the first three months was just you gone training, mm -hmm. seeing her here and there a couple times. Yeah, the first three months was in St. Jean, Quebec. Okay. So that's basic training. And then the second three months was in Meaford, which was battle school. And we, I got to see her for a couple of weekends there. I got to see her more in battle school than I did. So six basic. months? Yeah. Of not really seeing your family? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was definitely a challenge. And nothing about those six months kind of said to you, like, I'm going to step back. I'm not doing this. Mm. You were so sold out mm. on the idea that you're going to go through with it. Yeah, I, I guess part of that, as far as my personality goes, is I don't quit very easy with things. If I say I'm going to do something, I try and accomplish that thing. Mm -hmm. so I don't like it. I feel like it would reflect poorly on my character. Yeah. I, don't like, I just don't want that burden on, on myself. Or on my I know guys who do the opposite, right? They try so many different things, and just as it gets hard, they give up. And then 
Yeah. That maybe seem normal to everybody else, but it's like, hey, you just gave up on a very big thing. That's not a good good look on you, right? Yeah. So I don't I, I don't like that idea of being a quitter. So there was definitely some challenges, but I mean <clears throat> it's really encouraging to me to look back on that time and see God working because there was there was some moments where things like were not looking good and uh, God just really pulled through and, and was able to bring us through in the minimum amount of time necessary to accomplish what I needed to accomplish, basically. So I was Like you feel actual miraculous things? I mean, I guess on the outside it might not look miraculous, but at the time they seem Depending pretty on miraculous your perspective, to me. Right? Yeah. If you're praying about it and it doesn't yeah. seem like it's going to happen, then it does happen. Yeah. And you're like... So one of, the, one of the things, the way that... The way that it works out. There's there's a lot of merit systems when it comes to the army. So when I went to battle school, I got to battle school and they have they run it in courses. So when a course starts, they have a certain intake for that course. And if you're not on that intake, then you have to sit for that three or four or five months until they start another course to actually go through. And you just basically have to sit there on base and do nothing, um, do like inter like training and whatever some odd jobs here and there. But you're basically stuck there. So for somebody that's that is a single 18-year-old um, who has nothing else to do, that's fine. But for me, I had a wife and three kids and a house and a mortgage and all sorts of things. And staying in basic training for an extra potentially six months or in some cases a year, it, you, you weren't guaranteed when they would run a course. That would have been like, that would have meant not being on course would have meant I would have had to left, leave the army basically. Because you weren't getting paid to... For the basic training, we were getting paid, but it was very minimal. Yeah, it was significantly less than your regular salary, and you had to pay some additional things too, like your your food and things, hmm. which was sort of expensive. So, um, when I first got there, they were running a course basically the next week, and the course was filled up with people that were already waiting on that base to go to that course, and there was only a handful of spots open to go on on course. So the way that they did it, the way that they chose the people, there was there was roughly 40 people coming from my basic training course to this battle school who were trying to get on course. So there was a, there was a big group of people that were competing for these five or six spots on course. And um, they were just going to do a fitness test, basically. So they just were going to do running and push-ups and uh, just a couple different fitness exercises. And then the people with the top scores were, were going to get to go on course. So uh, it, the first thing that we did was a run. It was just like a mile and a half run, pretty basic. And I ran and I got second place. Oh, so, there you go. I mean, I, I've always been relatively fit. Like, it wasn't too much of a struggle to accomplish the physical aspects of it. And the next thing was push-ups. And I don't know what everybody else scored, but I know I got very close to the highest score. And after everything was done, I, I was pretty confident that I was going to be on course. And um, the next day, they had the list of all the names. And they were just going through the list. The, the NCO was going through the list of names and reading people off who were going to be on course. And he went through the five or six names and I wasn't on there. And I know some of the people that like, I got to see people you finishing behind them, me yeah. in all of these, in all of these tasks and they were going and, and uh, it was super discouraging for me at the moment. And I went to talk to the sergeant and the reason I wasn't called was because my name was on the back of the list. No way. I didn't fit on the front of the list. So I didn't make a course just because the NCO was not competent enough to flip over the list and look at all the names. So, I mean, for me, as soon as I heard that, I went back to my bunk and I prayed. Because, I mean, this was, if I wasn't on course, this was going to mean I was going to have to basically quit and oh, go wow. home. Um, and I prayed. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a little bit of a long story, but it just so happens that I, it's worth explaining. It was kind yeah. of a fun story. The next day, we, we just went for a PT session. We went for a run. And it happened to be a very strenuous run. And it was... Um, we were supposed to keep up with the NCO and just go for this long, drawn-out run. So at the end of it, everybody who didn't keep up with the NCO got sent back to the bunks. And there, there was like, I don't know, four or five of us there. Um, and he basically said, okay, you guys, get your stuff, you're going on course. And they just happened to have a couple extra spots. So the second I so heard that... it was like that, a secondary yeah, test. Yeah, it was a, a secondary thing. And, and I guess some, some people who were on course... They got kicked off for some reason. They got kicked off course, so a couple spots opened up. Wow. And there was, I don't even remember the number, but there was a couple of us. There might have been even three. I think it was the one, uh, a handful of us, just like three of us that got to go. And uh, we were all super excited, the, th the couple of us that got to go. But they went back to their bunks, 
And they just started telling all their friends. Like, they were pumped and they were talking to the other guys about going on course, and I didn't. The second I heard that, I went to my bunk and grabbed my gear and ran upstairs. And then as soon as that happened, the NCO came back and he said, no, there's only one spot on course. So the other two guys didn't get to go. It was only me that got to go, that got to take that They chose you, or was it because you were upstairs? It was because I was upstairs. They couldn't find me. So they found the other two guys downstairs, and I, I was oh, already man. gone, so... Wow, oh, that's to, that's pretty cool. Yeah, God answered prayer there, so I was pretty excited about that. Organize the circumstances just so, eh? Yeah. Man, that's cool. And that that's what got you in into Petawawa then already. That so that was still basic. Okay. Yeah. So that was, uh, or sorry, excuse me, that was battle school. So that's basically infantry training where they would give you all your weapons training and. Field training. But then you got to call Bethany and the girls and have them come out to where you were? So after that course was completed, that was the three-month course, oh, the second I see. three months. And then after that, you get your posting, and I was posted in Petawawa. So once I was posted, I got to take the family. Then there was a, a big sigh of relief yeah. where you could finally see your family again. Yeah. I know I heard about you during that time. We weren't really interacting much, mm-hmm. but I heard that you had been gone for months at a time, and mm-hmm. I was seeing some updates from Bethany on Facebook, and I'm like, what in the world is he doing? Mm-hmm. I know you're very family-centered. I know you're girls meant everything to you mm-hmm. how could you give up all that time right but I mean it seems like it partially it was just your personality mm-hmm. but it seemed like maybe this was the way that God directed your life too eh? yeah I, I I don't really have a good explanation um, maybe part of it was selfish like I, I like the idea of adventure and I definitely wanted some before I got past a point where it would be a reasonable expecta- expectation to do with a family so I mean that was a big part of it I mean part of it was selfish I think but um, God made it work out in such a way. Like, I feel like there was sacrifices and there was a lot of time spent away from the family. But in the end, it got paid back. Like, my time in the army was probably somewhat exceptional compared to most people's experiences. I got a lot of time at home with the family. Like, I ended up getting, a, like, a, an exceptional amount of time at home with the family while I was in the army. So, in the end, I, I feel like you got... You spent more time, time with your back. family than most guys would yeah. that work the yeah. 60 hours a week or whatever. Yeah. So, it was, it was good cool. in, the, in the end. So, then, uh, would you recommend young guys to join the military? Young men? Absolutely do not join the military. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say... I mean, it's, it can be a very positive experience, but, I mean, people should go into it with their eyes wide open. It is not moral. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons I wanted to go was because I had an expectation that I would learn um, some character, basically that I would be able to That's have That's kind of the idea you get, character. the impression yeah. you get from movies, right, is that it takes like half-disciplined people and turns them into strong disciplinary, exactly. disciplinary type of men. And I was hoping that that would be the case, that it would, that it would give me more discipline and, and build character and make me a better person. Like I had expectations that I would grow as a human being through my time in the military, and that wasn't at all the case. So, I mean, I don't want this to sound arrogant, but I found I took a lot more um, character in that, than I could, would have found there. And um, Most of the other men around you were falling into pretty grave sin. And that's, that's, it just has to do with the atmosphere. So the majority of people that get into the military are young men age 18 to 22, and they are not around any authority structure that would... That would uh, restrict them from just fulfill, like completely fulfilling the desires of their flesh. And that's what happens when they, you have opportunity. So, I mean, for somebody who is married, I would say that, I mean, it would be a reasonable thing to go into the army. But for young guys who don't really have a, an authority structure, somebody to look up to or are not like incredibly st- firm and committed to the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and have a very That's foundation. kind of strange then because ideally you want the 18 to 25 year old men that are not married to be the ones to serve your country because if they something happens to them, at least they're not leaving a widow behind. Yeah. But at the same time, you send someone like that into a military and they're going to get into the most debauched life that you can imagine. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if there's a young man who's mature and he's married, I mean, there's, there's opportunity in the military and it can be fun and adventurous. But, but it was constant ch- challenge to your faith too and you had to stand firm <clears throat> in your convictions. and. You know. Yeah. I mean, personally, I didn't find those things much of a... They didn't challenge my faith particularly, but I mean, but you, you've said situation. before that most of the young guys kind of saw you as the old mature guy, right? Because yeah. you were in your 30s already, or almost 30. Well, at that point when I signed up, I was 26. Right. And I was doing these, like on these courses, I was 26. 
but at that point I was already married and had three kids. Yeah. And, I mean, they could say things like they, I mean, all, you're constantly hearing things about their escapades, like their sexual exploits and things like this. And they would come back and crack jokes at me for being married. And I mean, we could get in a long conversation. About yeah, this. No, but I mean, those things didn't affect me yep. as the same, the same way that would affect a, an 18 year old who's uh, maybe a little more prone to peer pressure. Right. So. so I guess uh, maybe we'll have to fast track a few things a little bit here. I know you spent three years with the military and then uh, things kind of just fell apart. It, it wasn't looking like you were going to go any further. You never did get deployed. You didn't get to go on any, you know, battle scenes or anything like that. You got to fire a bunch of guns and enjoy the, the learning but didn't have to face any actual mm -hmm. combat, right? Yeah. And then you got sent home with your family, mm -hmm. and that's when we kind of got reconnected. You started coming around to Springfield, mm -hmm. and you had five, four kids at the time? Yeah, I think four. It was just we would have had four when we moved back, yeah. yeah. And now I've had your sixth. Mm -hmm. And now some other big uh, move has happened in the last little while. It was probably three years ago now where we had a young girl come to uh, our youth night. Greg was helping out with our youth nights. He was teaching there sometimes, and uh, we invited a young girl from a... a uh, missionary training center or from a missionary organization at the time was called New Tribes Missions or had just switched their name to Ethnos 360 mm -hmm. and she presented the idea of foreign missions in a way that uh, left quite an impression on you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to take it up there. Yeah, it was just over two years ago. Just over two now? Yeah, okay, I'm sticking years. three because you had been in Wisconsin for almost two years, but yeah. it wasn't quite. We were just doing the math, so we've been in training for two years now, but yeah, we don't, we don't have to get ahead of ourselves. So originally the, the thing that put this some of these thoughts in our mind was when we met the Martin family, um, Jessica and Jordan Martin. They came to GF, or to uh, Springfield. Springfield and had shared about their experience. They were with eth Ethnos. They were getting trained with Ethnos, yeah. getting ready to be sent out. Yeah. Uh, they were planning on going up north uh, to do ministry among the Inuit. And so they, they just really left an impression on us. And uh, I've always been somewhat mission-minded, I guess, Like, but I, I've very much been more uh, focused on national missionaries, just supporting national missionaries. And I thought maybe the idea of sending like a Western person into some of these places just seemed like poor stewardship. I remember you saying that before yeah. before Ethnos came around. Yeah, and I, I still, I guess, have some of those concerns when you consider that you can support a missionary in India for a couple hundred dollars yeah. a month. Whereas, Versus sending you and me there would cost probably 90, 100 grand a month, a year yeah. to, to pay for. It, it's significantly cheaper, but um, once we met them and then later we met uh, the MK um, Heidi Goud, and she shared about her testimony growing up in Papua New Guinea. She had some crazy stories yes, in Papua New Guinea. very crazy stories. And, I mean, that was really the whole idea of tribal missions specifically was we had no idea that there was still groups in the world, like actually thousands of groups. Do you have some actual numbers? How many, how many people groups, languages that don't have the gospel do you know offhand? Oh, goodness. No, I don't. This okay. Is, I, I wish I did. So I, it is like a couple thousand, I think. There's a couple thousand language groups in the world that, that where people still speak like living languages. In a lot of cases, they're monocultural. They don't speak a second language. Right. A lot of cases they do, but uh, languages and cultures that actually don't have the, the Bible or the no gospel. No Bible and no church and presence. No opportunity to hear the gospel. And uh, Heidi was sharing about her parents' experience in Papua New Guinea amongst the tribe. Um, that They were there for close to 30 years planting a church and just the diligence and patience of these people. It took them 17 years um, to win amongst first, these people. Yeah. No, before they even learned the language. Oh, was they it that spent long? 17 years there just learning the language in order to share the yeah. gospel with these people. And then I think close to another decade before they actually had a church. And uh, I just was blown away with the commitment of those people. They gave their whole life yeah. to this idea, right? Of that, that this small group, not a big group, a couple thousand people, of people in the tribe, in the tribe in the mountains of Papua New Guinea, and they were willing to give their whole life to these people. So then, when you start thinking about term, like in terms of money, finances, you think, well, maybe it wasn't the best use of money, mm -hmm. but here was a family that was willing to give up the rest of their life. They mm -hmm. didn't need a lot of money to be supported there. They, once they moved in and settled, getting them was expensive, mm -hmm. but then once they're there, they just stayed there and stayed there and mm -hmm. stayed there and gave their lives for mm -hmm. these people. 
Yeah, and uh, the result, the church was planted in a place that wouldn't have ever heard about the gospel if somebody wasn't willing to do that. And now hopefully from there, that, it will yeah. expand further. As the church, that church grows and matures, and, and a lot of those churches in these tribal places, as they grow and mature, um, they raise up elders and people who are uh, firm in their understanding of the gospel and the word that they send out missionaries themselves to reach yeah. tribes, their neighboring tribes. And they can transition much quicker to yeah. the other languages that are in their own countries and stuff. Yeah. But that just opened my eyes, I guess, that there is actually still a need for, you know... Cross-cultural. That, yeah, that, that niche need for people who are willing to go and do something very unnatural, to just go to a totally foreign culture and learn a language and a culture that you know nothing about so that you can translate the Bible to these people who would never be able to read it and uh, share the gospel with them and plant a church. And I guess once she infected my mind with that idea, it was, yeah, it was there. Probably (laughs) almost similar to when you decided to become, uh, to to join the military, where you're just like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Nothing's going to stop me. The way it worked, it was really interesting. And again, this was sort of, God working, I guess, in these circumstances. But when we first heard, we were really excited. But I remember telling you specifically, it was, I think, the next Sunday, I said, almost in these, these exact words, is, I, I love the idea of this, but I know I will never go and be a missionary. And my logic was, I remember explaining this to you, was I was just too focused on my family, that I wouldn't be willing to, to um, compromise or put them in a situation that might be detrimental to them in order to go to a different place and preach the gospel. And that was like, when she, or when I originally heard some of these things from Heidi, it would have been roughly October. And then we, the church at Springfield had invited her back to speak to the whole congregation to just share a little bit about her testimony in Papua New Guinea. And uh, it just turns out that that day there was a big ice storm. Yeah. And we happened to be halfway in between the church and where she was living in Hamilton. And while she was on her way, uh, she got caught up in the ice storm and totaled her truck. And we just happened to be the closest people yeah. to her. So we went and picked her up off the highway, off the 401 highway, and drove back to our place. And we got to spend the day she, with her. She infected you some more. Yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, she s- shared her whole testimony. And we just got to hear in a lot more detail about her experiences in Papua New Guinea and, and what it was formerly New Tribes Mission, what they currently are known as is Ethnos. If, if you guys are interested in hearing more, there's a video on YouTube called E Tau. I think it's E E and then T O U W, something like that. If you look it up on YouTube, it's an incredible reenactment of one of the first New Tribes Missions missionaries that had gone to Papua New Guinea and where a whole tribe came to Jesus. And it's, it's an incredible story, very touching. But that's what turned me on to ethnos or eat new tribes in the first place. Mm-hmm. But uh, there, after talking to her, then you felt that maybe there was a way for you to, to do this kind of life and still continue to raise your kids the way you wanted? Yeah. Because the way that Heidi was raised, her parents didn't really school her. They kind of sent her off to different schools and, mm-hmm. and other people kind of took care of raising her in, mm-hmm. to a degree anyway, right? Where that discouraged me. I didn't want to be a missionary in that sense where my family would become second to the mission, right? Mm-hmm. And that culture is changing amongst missionaries, but in the past, a lot of missionaries have done that where they've sent their kids to missionary boarding schools, but a lot more uh, missionaries are training, their, like uh, homeschooling their children um, while they're just in the field with their in in the tribe with yeah. the people. But uh, yeah, so once we, I guess once that barrier was crossed where I, I realized that, you know, the Great Commission, you don't have to sacrifice your family to fulfill the Great Commission. And uh, it just, it was, yeah, kind of like you said, God just, that seed was planted in my heart and it kept growing and growing until eventually Bethany and I both agreed and hmm. we said yes. So that took about a month and a half. So um, we were talking so it's to like Heidi. a whirlwind now, eh? Yeah, we were talking to Heidi in the end of November, and by December 15th, we had decided we were going to go. So we started packing up all of our stuff. Yeah. And then in January, Dan and his family we drove us to Wisconsin. Went on down to Wisconsin with a trailer load full of stuff. Yeah. That's crazy. I know, back to that other idea, though. Um, I read a lot of missionary biographies and great preachers of the past, their biographies. And one thing seemed to be almost more common than not was that these great men of God would end up sacrificing their wives or their kids, mm-hmm. not in, in death, but 
they would kind of give them up to other things, right? Where they would mm -hmm. leave their kids in, in Europe or in England and go off to Africa and serve God for 10, 15 years and then come back and see their kids maybe two or three times in between mm -hmm. and they ended up losing their children. Or someone like John Wesley who preached all over the, the British countryside but his marriage was horrible because he was never home and he, you know, they just didn't get along well. She was maybe ornery and difficult and he just wasn't a great husband. And you, you see that way too often where someone who has dedicated their life to a ministry and a service, but I think disqualified from themselves from that ministry and service by not being a good husband, by not being a good father, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the qualifications for church elders, right? That she, she, he must be the husband of one wife and that he would raise his children with all gravity and that they would not be accused of riot and all that kind of stuff where I would feel like a, a godly man that doesn't treat his wife well or a man, a servant of God that doesn't treat his wife well, doesn't raise his kids well, is no longer qualified or fit for the service, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I know how passionate you are about family devotions and about you know homeschooling your girls and all that. So, and that's why that's why I couldn't reconcile the idea of doing missions with um, raising a family, like the the whole idea even from the scripture. Like you look at the Bible, and the one thing that's almost without fail, like you, there's almost no examples in the Bible of good parents, of good fathers specifically. There's a couple. But there's very few, even like great men that we would think of as like wonderful men of God, like David. I mean, by all the scriptural accounts that we have, is a wasn't terrible a great father. Dad, yeah. No, and uh, Samuel was the same thing. Samuel, who got to see Eli's failures himself, felt to the Did exact almost same, the same thing. thing yeah. The same thing, and you see all these people, and and um, that was always my fear. I didn't want to be a bad father. I didn't want to to lose my kids to the world because I was, you know, so caught up in it. And um, if these men can, can do that, you know, like Samuel and David and, and all these people that God used in absolutely miraculous ways can be good, great in some ways and yet be terrible fathers. I just realized that that was not something that I was willing to do. I wasn't willing to be great and sacrifice my family to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that it's, I guess God's just brought me to the place where I believe that you can, not, not that I have a desire to be great, but that I can be faithful in both right. ways. Well, it's not just missionaries. I think missionaries puts more of a strain on you probably than, say, pastoring a church or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a lot, a lot of pressure on me, but I, I'm one of the pastors of our church. And I'm not saying that we've succeeded in every way either, but I focus more on my family than I do on our church. Mm -hmm. And that's that, to me, should go without saying. If I want to be a good leader in the church... If I don't know how to raise my own children and rule my own household well, mm -hmm. then how shall I rule the church of God, mm -hmm. Tim Paul says to Timothy. Mm -hmm. So for me, my primary focus is my wife and my family. If my wife's not enjoying life and isn't happy and fulfilled and rejoicing, then who am I to lead anyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so with missionary type work, I can easily see it. Like I, I work from home. I home, We homeschool our kids. I'm always around the family. I can easily see a missionary lifestyle being kind of somewhat to what, similar to what I do here, mm -hmm. where you could you could tinker around with your kids, you could work with them sometimes, and then you could go out and minister to the locals wherever you end up going, mm -hmm. and we can get into that too, right? But I could see it being a very good homeschool type environment where you're at the same time you're giving your life to evangelism. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see why it should have to run contrary to each other, right? Exactly, and that's sort of our our... Our desire and our view, I guess, is we hope to not just bring our children along for ministry, but we hope that they can be part of our ministry someday in the future, that they'll be part with us in the tribe, um, in a tribe somewhere, learning the language and making friends and having opportunities to share the gospel with these people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's our hope and our <clears throat> desire. And I know one thing you've also been very clear with me on is that you don't want to, to beg for money or ask people for donations. You want people just, if they are going to support you, that they would do it out of a genuine heart for what you're doing, right? At the same time, how are people going to know that you're going to have a need if we don't say something, right? So far, you're not accepting any donations. You're not taking money for your cause, right? There's nothing set up for you yet to start getting supplementation from anyone. Yeah, this is always an awkward point for me. Sure, <laughs> sure it is. Yeah. So um, we, ha we haven't solicited any money because at this, at this point, in, we're just going through training. So right. uh, we're currently at the Emanate campus in Durham, Ontario. For it's a, like a missionary training sem a school or a yes, seminary? Yeah, so it's basically a missionary training center where you'd learn a lot of the like much more practical skills for cross-cultural missions where they would just 
I mean, some of the courses that we've been doing in the last semester have just really been what to expect when you're going into a new culture, how to uh, assimilate and learn things and um, not offend the people that you're going to minister immediately when you go there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Eventually, they learn. They teach you how to pick up on phonetics and stuff, yeah, right? To learn a language and how to put a put it to writing and yeah, all that. Kind you of stuff. would learn lots of language skills, uh, much more in depth grammar, lots of phonetics and phonemics, which is basically the science of speaking. Um, the sounds that you can make with your mouth. There's lots of sounds that you can make with your mouth that we don't make in our language. Mm-hmm. That if you know these things and you know if there's a. a a kind of a generic alphabet that you can use in any language that yeah. kind of cr- that covers all sounds. So they teach you this this alphabet so that when you go to a tribe... Even the nasal you, languages exactly, and stuff? Exactly, the nasal sounds. You, there's letters, universal letters that you can use for those sounds. So once you know the language, know the sounds, and, and you've sort of mastered that language, then you can put that, encode it in writing. Um, and the goal would be eventually it. you could translate the yeah. Bible even. You would translate the Bible. You would teach literacy courses to the people. So you'd actually teach them their own language in writing and so that they can learn and eventually read the scriptures in their own language. That's if they don't have a written language. Yes. But you guys haven't really settled on where you would go if if you could go somewhere, if things open up. Yeah, and that's sort of just the way that the world is at this point is there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, in yeah. everywhere. Crossing borders is kind yeah. of an issue right now. Yeah, so we've one of the things, we've been considering a couple things. Um, Southern Mexico, there's some very big uh, unreached groups that would be, there's lots of definitions of unreached. So the, some of the very big tribes in Southern Mexico, they would have, that would be considered like one and a half, maybe percent reached. Okay. Which, so there are some Christians there, but it's such a low percentage and there's somewhat persecuted by some of the other groups. So they're very low gospel presence. And, uh, but that was one thing that we've been considering. And another thing is, uh, to the ministering to the Inuit in the north, so that's really not something that I would ever. That's naturally, quite a contrast. Yeah. South Mexico yeah. or North Canada. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, Mexico is significantly more appealing. Oh yes, <laughs> for many reasons. Yes, so something that we've been considering, and we really don't know if that's going to be the case. There's really barriers at this, with politics the way that they are, the global situation. There's almost barriers whichever direction that you want to go. So we're really just. just Praying about it and considering and seeing where the Lord would have us. And you've got another year of training. Yeah, we'll be finished training in a year, and and at that point we really hope to have a direction like we're to go. And if not, we'll pick a place. And they yeah. need the gospel everywhere. So yeah, for sure. And just hope that the Lord can can use us wherever. He, he <laughs> so if if you don't have like a link that I can share or a website to go to at this point yet, maybe people just keep staying tuned into my stuff, and eventually I'll be able to share things with them. Yeah. There's nowhere to go to at this point. Well, at, like I said, we're not really soliciting anything. Um, so far, you're able to make it off of the income that you have? Yeah, we've been able to to, to make it. The Lord's been very gracious with us and generous. And um, yeah, we, we've been... That's good. Anything else you want to share? We usually try to wrap it up in about an hour, and we're nearing that point now. Pretty quick, eh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It goes fast. Let's share your, your final thing about your passion for this, your passion for life, for family, for ministry, whatever it might be, something that comes to mind. I mean, I guess my final plea, if I was, if, if I just had the opportunity to say anything, would just be the gospel is, I guess one thing that we don't consider in our Western culture, like we look on every church corner, on every corner and there's a church, like everywhere we look, there's churches. Um, we have almost everybody, even unbelievers has a Bible in their house. Yeah. You know, the, Hotels have them. It's just so prevalent, we don't even give it a second thought. And uh, most people don't realize, I guess, that there is literally a huge portion of the, of the Earth's population like that never has an opportunity to hear the gospel, would never I, I can't even seem gospel. to go there. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's places in the world they, that people will, in their whole life of interacting with other people, may never come across a believer. Which I mean, to, or a church, or a, a Bible, Bible. As, especially one that they understand. So I mean, we, and when I say that, I'm not joking. Like, there's actually 33% of the population, like well north of 2 billion people, who have never heard the gospel. Mm-hmm. And um, people need to. We have a mission. Yeah, we, we have a mission. God's given the us church a task. is not here a for, as a as a social yeah. uh, club, right? Yes. We so, have a mission. Yeah. So. 
I would just encourage people, however you can, be get involved. You know, God's given us the commission. Absolutely. I, I heard someone, I mean, we've, we've heard that illustration many times, right? Whether you're the one that's going down into the well or the one that's holding the rope at the mm-hmm. top, somehow mis- Christians should all be invested in reaching the world of the gospel mm-hmm. one way, shape, form, or another, right? Mm-hmm. So that's, I appreciate that. Anything else that I forgot or you wanted to add? Something that you had kind of thought, I hope we cover this topic? Oh, not at all. No, it's good. All right, appreciate it.